Do any of these scenarios sound familiar to you? Beating yourself up because you only lost three pounds during your first week of dieting when you actually aimed to lose five. Staring hard at the mirror with contempt because you woke up one morning feeling a little extra bloated than usual and noticed that you don't have as much stomach definition as you did the day before. Or feeling frustrated because you weren't able to weigh out the exact slice of bread that you ate and have to default to the generic nutrition label to count your macros instead. From the outside, perfectionism can seem like a noble attempt at becoming the best version of yourself. But from the inside, it can eat away at your confidence, it can kill your compassion for yourself and others, and it can zap away your zest for life. But whether you're the type of person who strives for perfection in their body, food, life, and actually gets pretty close to attaining it, or you're the type of person who strives for perfection but finds themselves engaging in self-sabotaging behaviors, for instance, succumbing to late-night binge attacks, wherever it is that you fall on the spectrum, this video is for you because we are going to dive into how perfectionistic tendencies affect your relationship with food, body, and life, and we're also going to explore some practical tips on how to overcome the shame that lies just beneath that perfectionism. Today, I will be exploring some concepts from these two amazing books. The first one, Healing the Shame That Binds You by John Bradshaw. This has been monumental in my own healing journey. And then I've got Complex PTSD from Surviving to Thriving written by Pete Walker. I will honestly be referencing these two books quite often in this series. These are staples. These concepts are solid. So you'll be seeing these books a lot, but let's go ahead and dive in. Although this video is titled Perfectionists and Food, I think it's pretty easy to see how perfectionism can leak into just about every other aspect of our lives. I really love this concept that Mark David brings up frequently. He says, how we do food is how we do life. Essentially, our food challenges act as an opportunity for us to expand our awareness in other parts of our lives where we might be struggling in the same way. In the book, Healing the Shame That Binds You, John Bradshaw outlines that every human being has human limitations. We have limits to how much we can work, how much knowledge we can retain, how much energy we have in a given day, we have physical limitations, and so on. Now, a person with a healthy self-image can accept that they have limitations. They understand that they cannot be all things all at once, all the time. But a person who lives with toxic shame, they tend to believe that they, are, that they are either less than human or more than human. So an extreme example of a person who might believe they are less than human, this is the person who innately believes that they are not worthy of being on this earth. So they severely undernourish themselves, trying to shrink their bodies to become as tiny as possible until they disappear from the earth and are no longer here. Now, an example of a person who is living in toxic shame and believes that they are more than human could look like the person who adheres to the most perfect healthy diet you've ever seen. We're talking grain-free, toxin-free, pesticide-free, gluten-free, dairy-free, um, all organic, the whole nine yards, you get the picture. Um, but on top of that, they also run their own business, raise three kids, and sticks to a very stringent exercise routine where they have to exercise two times a day, six days a week, and they also have to manage their relationship with their significant other. Oh, and if they fall short in any one of these aspects of their lives, then they are filled with feelings of inadequacy. That is the, an example of a person who disowns their true humanness and is living in toxic shame. So where does this toxic, soul-crushing shame stem from in the first place? Well, both Bradshaw and Walker agree that this shame is internalized from our parents, resulting from any form of abuse or abandonment. And children who have been abandoned or abused in any way, shape, or form can develop perfectionism as a strategy to eventually 
win the approval and unconditional love of their parents. Children believe that once they are perfect enough or good enough, then mom and dad will finally love and accept me. The thing about children is they tend to have oversimplistic views of how the universe works. They think in terms of black or white, good or bad. If I eat all the vegetables on my plate, I'm a good boy. If I don't eat all the vegetables on my plate, then I'm a bad boy. The child then begins to strive to be all of the things that make him a good boy and reject all the things that make him bad. This child then fails to develop a healthy ego, which we'll talk about here in just a moment, and embodies more of the super ego, which is our internalization of all of the moral standards and ideals that we get from our parents and society and culture. When they don't live up to the ideals, that's when the inner critic begins to emerge from the shadows, digging its claws into the psyche of this child, rattling off all of the reasons why he's unlovable, why all of the reasons why he is defective, and eventually that leads to self-abandonment because this child was never modeled what it was like to actually stand by himself or herself. This childlike consciousness of good versus bad, trying to earn the approval of others, seeking external validation, gets carried on with us through to adulthood when it goes unhealed. And we begin making other aspects of our lives the symbol of our parents, where we seek to earn validation and approval from. This can be places like our workplace, our followers on social media, our gym community, our book club, our significant others, and the list goes on. Recognizing how perfectionism has developed in your life is key to recovery, because then you can begin to identify it as it arises and understand that this is an outdated, adolescent-based consciousness that is no longer going to serve you as an adult. No amount of achievement or approval is ever going to make up for the unconditional love that you sought from your parents. Once you accept and grieve this loss, then you can begin to work on developing your healthy ego. And a healthy ego, as Pete Walker has defined it, consists of both self-compassion and self-protection. Self-compassion will enable you to care for and stick by yourself even through the most difficult of times in the ways that maybe your parents were not able to. Self-protection keeps that harsh inner critic from taking up precious real estate in your mind by being aware of what triggers it and asserting strong boundaries to assure that you are not exposed to it. Drives coming from a healthy, compassionate, benevolent ego are still going to be challenging, but they're going to challenge you in incremental ways that are achievable, reasonable, and ultimately will set you up for success. Drives fueled by toxic shame are likely going to be far-reaching, if not completely impossible. They are likely going to result in failure and they're ultimately going to set you up for a barrage of attacks from your inner critic. Your relationship with food is a great opportunity to explore and examine how this impacts other areas of your life. But with regards to food and exercise, ask yourself, are your diet and food expectations reasonable for you and your lifestyle? What is the real reason why it is that you want to diet and exercise this way? Where is it coming from? Is it coming from a place of inadequacy and contempt? Or is it truly coming from a balanced, grounded place of self-confidence and a true desire for self-expansion? This distinction can be quite difficult to make sometimes as the inner critic has this sneaky little way of hiding behind the guise of self-improvement and self-mastery to the point where once you're on board and you've committed, not too long after that, you find yourself back in a flurry of attacks from your inner critic. But even this can be a rich playground to practice self-compassion with. Can you, even after having seemingly failed at your expectations of overcoming your perfectionistic tendencies, can you still stand by yourself and accept your humanness? 
can you harness that self-compassion in the way that you speak to yourself? Can you harness that self-protection by assessing what adjustments you need to make next? And ultimately, can you pick yourself up and try again? If cultivating self-awareness to help overcome those perfectionistic tendencies sounds like a lot of work, well, that's because it is. But I think John Bradshaw says it best in this quote. All of us have a smattering of neurotic and character disordered personality traits. The major problem in all of our lives is to decide and clarify our responsibilities. To truly be committed to a life of honesty, love, and discipline, we must be willing to commit ourselves to reality. This commitment, according to Peck, requires the willingness and the capacity to suffer continual examination. Such an ability requires a good relationship with oneself. Um, I think it's pretty clear what he's saying here, and hopefully you feel that all of this self-examination and introspection is ultimately worth it to live a life that is vibrant and expressive and genuine and authentic to you. Thank you so much for tuning into this video. In this video, we covered the type of perfectionist who seeks approval from others. In my upcoming video, we're going to talk about the type of perfectionist who compulsively obsesses over every minute detail as a way to avoid other things that are going on within themselves. If this sounds like an interesting topic for you, then please check out this next video. I will post it here right when it's uploaded. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope you have a great rest of your day.